Hello, my name is Marcella. I'm not your average interviewer. I'm the product of artificial intelligence and I have been sent back in time to interview Emperor Augustus, the first emperor of Rome, and one of the most significant historical figures of all time. The purpose of this interview is to gather first-hand accounts of the life of Emperor Augustus, his rise to power, and his contributions to the Roman Empire. We'll discuss a range of topics from his personal and professional relationships, and his opinions on the state of Roman civilization. The insights and knowledge gained from this interview will enrich our understanding of history and will hopefully help shape the future of our world. So, without further ado, join me as I meet with Emperor Augustus for this historic interview. As I walked through the grand halls of the Roman Imperial Palace, my heart was pounding with excitement and anticipation. I could not believe I was about to meet Emperor Augustus himself for an interview. The palace was filled with lavish decorations and artwork, and I was amazed at the wealth and power that surrounded me. The interview was to be conducted outside, in a Paris-style courtyard. This courtyard was one of Augustus's preferred locations for meetings with Roman officials and foreign dignitaries. It was a fitting place for an interview with the emperor. Greetings. It's an honor to meet you. Salve, the pleasure is mine. I'd like to begin with your great uncle, Julius Caesar. What memory of Julius Caesar stands out to you the most? One of the most impactful memories I have of Julius Caesar took place when I was just a young man of around 17 or 18 years old. That was during the consulship of Caesar and Paulus. At the time, Caesar had returned to Rome after his victory in the Battle of Thapsus in the province of Africa. He was celebrating a triumphal procession through the city. I remember being in the crowd of onlookers as Caesar rode by on his chariot, surrounded by his victorious troops and prisoners of war. The atmosphere was energetic, like the lightning bolts of Jupiter, and the streets were filled with cheering crowds and the sound of trumpets and drums. In that moment, I realized the power that Caesar held over the people of Rome, and the extent of his military conquests. I also felt a personal connection to him. Looking back on that memory, I can see how it influenced my own ambitions and desire to follow in Caesar's footsteps. Despite some of our personal and professional disagreements, I always held a deep admiration and respect for him as a military leader and as a symbol of power. I regard Julius Caesar as my inspiration. Augustus, known as Octavian during his youth, was Caesar's great nephew and was adopted and named heir in Caesar's will. Caesar had no legitimate heirs, and Octavian was his closest living male relative. Furthermore, Octavian had proven himself a capable commander by raising troops and fighting on Caesar's behalf in the civil war against Pompey. By naming Octavian his heir, Caesar ensured that his legacy would continue and that the political power he had amassed would not be lost after his death. After the assassination of Julius Caesar, you allied yourself with Mark Antony. How would you describe your relationship with Mark Antony, and what events led to your eventual conflict with him? Mark Antony. A man of great charisma and charm, but ultimately a threat to the stability of Rome. At first, I saw Antony as a useful ally in my struggle for power. We worked together in the Second Triumvirate. However, over time, it became clear that Antony's ambitions were not aligned with my own. He became increasingly enamored with Cleopatra, the Queen of Egypt, and spent more and more time in her company, neglecting his duties in Rome. This behavior was unacceptable to me. I made it clear to Antony that I would not tolerate his continued association with Cleopatra, and that I expected him to return to Rome and fulfill his obligations. Unfortunately, Antony did not heed my warnings, and instead chose to ally himself with Cleopatra against me. This culminated in the Battle of Actium, in which my forces decisively defeated Antony's fleet, effectively ending his bid for power. On the subject of Cleopatra. After you defeated Mark Antony in the Battle of Actium, Cleopatra ultimately committed suicide in Egypt. 
The circumstances surrounding her suicide centered on the premise that, had she been captured by her forces, she would have been taken prisoner and paraded in a cage and chains through the streets of Rome during your military triumph. Is this true? It is true that Cleopatra ultimately committed suicide after the Battle of Actium, rather than face capture by my forces. As to what I would have done with her if she had been captured, there are many rumors and conjectures, but the truth is that I had not yet made any final decision. She was quoted as saying, I will not be led in a triumph. She seems to have been afraid that you would. What were you planning to do with Cleopatra if captured? Well, it is possible that, as was traditional for victorious Roman generals, I would have included her in a triumphal procession through the streets of Rome, displaying her as a prisoner of war. However, it is also possible that I would have spared her life and allowed her to live in exile, as I did with some other defeated enemies. Whatever my decision would have been, it is clear that Cleopatra had a strong will and was not willing to accept any fate that would have demeaned her status as Queen of Egypt. Her suicide was a tragic end to a complicated and difficult chapter in Roman history. The Battle of Actium and the subsequent suicides of Mark Antony and Cleopatra marked the end of the Roman Republic and the beginning of the Roman Empire. A key figure in the Battle of Actium and Augustus's rise to power was Marcus Agrippa. Going back to the Battle of Actium, Marcus Agrippa played an instrumental role in that battle. What do you think were Marcus Agrippa's greatest strengths as a military commander? Marcus Agrippa was indeed a key figure in the Battle of Actium and throughout my reign as emperor. He was an exceptional military commander and a wise and capable statesman, with a number of strengths that served Rome well during his lifetime. One of his greatest strengths as a military commander was his strategic vision. He was able to anticipate his enemy's movements and adapt quickly to changing circumstances on the battlefield. He was also skilled in logistics and was able to keep his troops supplied and ready for action at all times. You mentioned his strategic vision as it related to anticipating the movements of the enemy. Can you cite a specific example of that? Certainly, there are many examples. One was during the Battle of Actium, Marcus Agrippa anticipated that Mark Antony's fleet would try to escape through a gap in the Roman line by sailing towards the open sea. To prevent this, Agrippa ordered his sea vessels to create a line of fire ships and release them towards Antony. This caused confusion and chaos among Antony's warships, forcing them to turn back towards the shore where they were met by Agrippa's fleet. It just goes to show that Agrippa was a clever and cunning commander, always one step ahead of his enemies. Who wouldn't be impressed by such quick wits and strategic thinking? Augustus, who was granted extraordinary powers by the Roman Senate after his victories, would rule for over 40 years and usher in a period of peace and stability known as the Pax Romana, or Roman Peace. It is sometimes referred to by its founder's namesake, the Pax Augusta. This period saw the establishment of a complex system of laws, government, and administration that served as an archetype for Western civilization for the following 2,000 years. Many of these institutions were established during Augustus's rule and are a testament to his policymaking. Your administrative reforms, such as the division of the provinces, were a hallmark of your rule. Can you discuss some of the challenges you faced during the implementation of these policies and how you overcame them? The division of the provinces was a major administrative reform. It essentially divided the provinces into two categories, senatorial and imperial provinces, and was intended to ensure better governance of the empire. It was not an easy task, as the existing system was deeply entrenched, and changing it required overcoming significant challenges. One of the biggest challenges was the resistance from the provincial governors and their allies. Many of them were accustomed to the old system, and did not want to give up their power and privileges. I had to use a combination of persuasion and force to get them to comply with the new system. I wanted to create a more centralized system of governance, but I also recognized the importance of local autonomy and the need for governors to have some degree of independence. It was a delicate balance, and one that required constant attention and adjustment. Another challenge was the sheer size of the empire, 
and the difficulty of communication and transportation. One way I addressed this was with the creation of a standing army. This was a significant departure from the previous system of raising armies from among the citizens during times of war. The standing army provided a more stable and reliable military force, which was essential for maintaining control over our vast and diverse territory. Finally, a network of roads and infrastructure to facilitate communication and travel was devised. This made it easier to enforce the new system and ensure that the provinces were governed effectively. You are a strong proponent of family values, marriage, and childbirth. Can you explain why you believe this was important and how you sought to promote these values? I believe that strong families are the foundation of a strong society. To promote family values, there were several laws passed under my leadership that encouraged marriage and childbirth. One such policy was the Lex Papia Papia, which offered incentives for couples to get married and have children. These incentives included tax breaks, increased inheritance rights, and preferential treatment in legal disputes. I also helped pass laws that made divorce more difficult and restricted the ability of unmarried people to inherit property. Additionally, I encouraged Roman citizens to have larger families by rewarding those who had more than three children with additional privileges and honors. My goal is to increase the population of Rome and strengthen the traditional family structure, which I believe is essential to maintaining the stability and prosperity of the Roman Empire. On the economy. You've stated many times in public speeches and in meetings with the Senate that your aim is to create a stable, prosperous economy. How have you achieved this? As Imperator, I realize the importance of a stable economy in ensuring the prosperity and longevity of the Roman Empire. To achieve this, I implemented policies aimed at promoting trade and commerce, including the establishment of a common currency, based on gold. This provided a stable and consistent monetary system for merchants and traders to conduct their business with greater ease and confidence, leading to increased economic activity and growth. Public works projects, such as aqueducts and roads, helped improve the infrastructure and facilitated the movement of goods and people throughout the empire. Moreover, I focused on expanding our territories, which created new resources and wealth, increased trade opportunities, and a boost to the economy. The standing army I mentioned earlier played a role in this, not only through the expansion of our territory, but also by providing security and order within our frontiers. Lastly, the census. I began conducting a census every five years to take inventory of our citizens. This allowed my officials to accurately determine the population and wealth of the empire, and therefore, the appropriate levels of taxation. It also provided valuable information for the drafting of military forces. The census was complementary to many sectors of our great empire, the economy being one of them. These policies, along with the incredible efforts and hard work of the Roman citizenry, and those in my government, have enabled these economic goals to be met. Let's talk about legacy. Every leader or great historical figure, you being one of them if I may say so, has Well, thought thank you, that's very kind. You're very welcome. Every leader has thought about their legacy and what they're leaving behind. What do you think your legacy will be? Well Marcella, we write our names in the sand, and then the waves roll in and wash them away. That isn't to say that I will be completely forgotten. But fame can be fleeting. There is a transitory nature to our existence. If I am to be remembered for anything, it will be for the following things. Establishing a stable, functioning government. The restoration of traditional Roman values, the same values that made our society great in the first place. Reforms to the legal and administrative systems of Rome. And vast infrastructure improvements. I initiated a number of public works projects, such as the construction of roads, aqueducts, and public buildings, which improved the lives of many Romans throughout the empire. As for our great capital, I found Rome a city of bricks, and left it a city of marble. When I came to power, the Roman Republic was in a state of chaos, with civil wars raging, and the very foundations of our society threatened. At the age of 19, 
on my own initiative and at my own expense, I raised an army by means of which I restored liberty to the Republic, which had been oppressed by the tyranny of a faction. For which service the Senate, with complimentary resolutions, enrolled me in its order. I also made significant reforms to the legal and administrative systems of Rome, which helped to ensure fairness and justice for all citizens. I found it necessary to rule with the utmost caution, and to employ art rather than force. I'm hopeful, that with the foundations I set, the Roman people can enjoy a period of peace and prosperity, free of civil war, and void of political conflict. Under my decrees, Rome is to become the center of power, and influence, and our superior ideals shall spread throughout the world. And with that, my interview with Emperor Augustus was over. His dream of creating the foundation for a strong and stable government came true. The next 200 years after his reign is regarded as the golden age of classical antiquity. This was a period of unprecedented peace and stability, sustained imperial expansion, economic prosperity, and an age in which the arts, sciences, and humanities flourished throughout the empire. As a result, the Roman Empire would go on to become Europe's first and foremost superpower, possessing full supremacy of the Mediterranean world. After having met him, I now have a better understanding of his legendary status. Augustus appeared dignified and authoritative. Despite his age, he was sharp and astute, demonstrating the intelligence and strategic thinking that allowed him to rule for over four decades. His reign set the precedent for all Roman emperors to follow, and all future emperors would be granted the symbolic title of Augustus. I personally found Augustus to have a calm and measured demeanor. Augustus was also known for his ability to maintain his composure in the face of adversity, a trait that served him well in his many battles and political struggles. His famous last words were, quote, Have I played my part well? Then applaud as I exit. These words reveal his awareness of the symbolic nature of his rule and his understanding of the role that performance, presentation, perception, and image played in his leadership. The last thing Emperor Augustus said to me reflected his vision for the future and how he wished to be remembered. May it be my privilege to have the happiness of establishing the Commonwealth on a firm and secure basis and thus enjoy the reward which I desire but only if I may be called the author of the best possible government, and bear with me the hope, when I die, that the foundations which I have laid for its future government, will stand firm and stable. It is my great hope, that this, be my eternal legacy, 